Hello Rocket fans and welcome back to the Copenhagen Suborbital Rocket Shop where we continue working on the world's only crude crowdfunded space rocket speaker. And today we want to talk a little bit about turbo pumps or more specifically electric turbo pumps. So some of you who follow us on Facebook, Twitter or Instagram might already know that we have a collaboration going with a startup from Norway called Orbital Machines who are trying to become the world's first commercial supplier of electric turbo pumps for small satellite launchers. Now, Copenhagen Suborbitals is not exactly that, but their origins have been inspired by what we do here. And because of that, they wanted to test their first electric turbo pump on our Spica's BPM-100 rocket engine. Which brings us to February 11, when Orbital Machines had an event in Trondheim, Norway to launch their crowdfunding campaign which is still running, so if you want to become a shareholder in the company, you can follow the link in the description box below and check it out. But this video is going to look at some of the presentations made during the event. And first we'll take a look at Ivan, who is the founder of the company, talking a little bit about what they do. And then we also had Jakob Larsen, who is our production coordinator, give a brief presentation of what Spica would look like with a electric turbo pump compared to a pressure fed system and just talk a little bit about turbo pumps in general but I hope you enjoy and take a look at it so I, I will say a few words very briefly about uh, who we are why we exist and so on uh, and then mostly I will just show like a slideshow of what has been going on the last year since the last time we were on Folk Invest and we raised the money to uh, found the company so what we do is uh, we build electric turbo pumps for launch vehicles. And what does that mean? Uh, a launch vehicle is a rocket that launches satellites into orbit. Over the next 10 years, tens of thousands of small satellites are uh, scheduled to be launched. And this requires, this has created a market for small launch vehicles, unlike the much larger vehicles that we are used, used to. We want to be the first supplier of electric turbo pumps to the space industry and we want to be the leader in that technology. One of the somewhat strange things about our company is we are, um, there's a couple of unusual things. One of them is that the, our origin. We are a spin-off from a Danish organization, which I think has the most awesome, ambitious project ever, which is to send the first human to space on a crowdfunded and volunteer-built vehicle. And this whole com this company exists basically because I, <coughs> I discovered this on YouTube and I thought that was the most amazing project ever. And I started working towards wanting to work with them. And when I went there and knocked on their door, they said kind of, meh, you, you, don't, you, you really know what you're doing? <laughs> um, which of course made me go back to university and I studied for a year especially well I have some background in engineer um, mechanical engineering and I built on that picking special courses um, spe especially targeted towards building a turbo pump for these rocket engines while I was there I met uh, other students who were very excited about space and during that year actually uh, Propulse was founded and also NTNU was founded and they have become very important collaborators. Yeah, and then uh, what happened was that I was just going to do a PhD on this uh, or, or work as a volunteer. But when we looked around, uh, we found that there is, well, tens of thousands of satellites are going to be launched in the next years. And also hundreds of launch vehicles are in development and they are all solving the same problem so we thought, well, if we make this into a company and we try to standardize it, that might be a good idea. We ended up making a campaign and we raised money, 1.8 million in 2018. And with that, we founded the company and I started working full time from January 2019. Uh, Ula joined some months later and now uh, end of 2019, Lucas joined as a full time employee as well. Instead of the normal uh, boring pitch about why this company is uh, valuable and so on. I'll do a recap of what we've done the last year. I think that's more interesting for you guys. So uh, another important collaborator is NTNU Water Hydropower Laboratory. Um, that might sound a bit strange, 
But uh, as Raquel says here, <laughs> this is a centrifugal pump and the hydropower laboratory is specialized in centrifugal pumps and turbines. That is exactly what they, they know how to do and they have the equipment for us to test it. So Raquel is working on a master's degree on our project to build a test rig and test our pump in the hydropower laboratory. We launched our product at Spaceport Norway, which is uh, Norway's uh, Space Expo, which is held once per year. So we hadn't built the, the product yet at that point, but we had this plastic prototype and we are basically saying, okay, we are now, uh, we have now designed this, uh, simulated it, we are ready to start selling it to customers. Then we went to Space Tech Expo Europe, which is Europe's biggest space technology expo. And there we really got all of our assumptions about the market validated. So we were approached by a lot of different companies. Uh, we had uh, more than 10 meetings with poten potential customers, basically more than we have time to follow up. Uh, yeah, and those are now in the pipeline. Uh, one of them, which I think is especially cool, is a space plane project uh, from Germany, a spin-off from the German uh, space agency who will send uh, satellites and possibly also people to space on a two-stage vehicle where the first stage is a plane that can land and thereby save huge amounts of fuel compared to, for example, SpaceX and their, their form of landing, using, which uses fuel. Ola has been hard at work with applying and among other things he's been doing for grants and we have been awarded two million Kroner in grants for projects in 2020. This needs to be matched by financing, and that's why we are aiming to uh, crowd to uh, collect 2,000 euros in investments through crowdfunding to match this. <coughs> two million, two million kron. Yeah. yeah, and we've got our our own prototype labor laboratory in Berlin, which is really Lucas's laboratory, which he doesn't pay anything for, which is a bit strange, a bit strange, and. Uh, we have access to uh, machines for creating, uh, for doing uh, machine uh, metal work, and we've actually, with Lucas's help, uh, created the first functional prototype of the pump, which we will show in a second. And here comes, uh, of course, our pilot project is in cooperation with uh, Copenhagen Suborbitals. We're building the pump for the rocket engine for the Spica rocket, which will build, uh, which will bring the first amateur to space. And this is the prototype. And now I will say, well, please welcome Lucas, who built most of the parts. Yeah, he brought this from Berlin. <laughs> this is a. We are going to work on the weight later when it when it works. It's a little bit heavy still. Yeah, so this is now going to uh, the hydropower laboratory at NTNU uh, for where, where Raquel is, uh, she's actually sitting here. She's doing the master thesis um, on testing this. We also, yeah. Okay. You want to take it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's designed to be light, it's just very over-dimensioned, just to be sure. Yeah. Okay, excuse me, how, how many horsepower are you going to apply on this? Uh, the pump is 150 kilowatt. Okay. Yeah. And the, the thrust of the engine is uh, 10 kilonewton, so that's 10 tons of thrust. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a really a small engine, it's like small launch vehicle sized. All right, thank you. Thank you. Uh, for the last speaker of today, I want you to meet uh, Jakob. He's from uh, Copenhagen Support Tools, Danish organization that is building the rocket speaker. Please tell us a little bit more about that. Thank you. thank you very much. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to come here and tell you a little about what we are doing as Copenhagen Support Tools. Copenhagen Support Tools is different. Um, <laughs> And my presentation will have two sides here. It will try and 
capture the enthusiasm about why rocketry is endlessly interesting and cool. And secondly, I'll go touch a little bit more on exactly as a practical application of what these turbo pumps do, why they are a, a bit of a mystery, and why they are so important. So let's try and, uh, and get this underway here. Um, the first thing, actually, uh, I want to touch a little bit on the uh, on the planetarium presentation we saw earlier, um, because if if there is a question or the question of why space comes up with that presentation in mind, there is a, a surprisingly simple and universal answer to that, and that is because space simply is there. I mean, everybody here knows where this with space is going. It's just going to grow and it's going to be more interesting, and the human need for exploration is never going to end. So let's try and keep that in mind when we go a little forward here. First, I'm lucky enough to be in the Danish space industry myself. I work as a system engineer and a QAP engineer in a small company called Rosing. Satellites, satellites like the big ones we see here, I don't work exactly with those, but Rosing does a whole lot of uh, systems that are needed to test and check out satellites. Satellite test systems, electrical ground support equipment, satellite interface simulators, launch platforms, orbital systems, etc. So I work with, uh, with the space industry on a daily basis. I have another passion. I also have happened to be fortunate enough to be vice chairman of the board of Copenhagen Suborbitals. I'm also a system engineer and a large scale production coordinator. And then launchpad leader, I've been fortunate and privileged enough twice to be the launchpad leader on two of our launches. And then honestly, I, I love just to build rocket engines. So moving a little forward here. Why? Copenhagen Suborbitals is a bit of a a rogue organization because we are crowdfunded and we're crowdfunded by just ordinary people that thinks space is immensely unique and interesting. And I guess most of you already here and most of the thousand supporters that support Copenhagen Suborbitals every month, everybody, any one of us wants to go there just a little bit to go explore and see what space is all about. So. Passion is a major driver in our volunteer-based organization, which counts approximately 50 members uh, and a core engineering team of uh, about 14 or 15 people. We're a nonprofit, so you can say that we are a very advanced tennis club in some respect. <laughs> um, and we, many of us have been doing this for years, and we find us repeatedly doing this because we can't let go of the passion of space and working with space and, and reaching out for space. So we are all volunteers, uh, we all have day jobs, and then somehow we find the extra time to do what we are doing in Copenhagen so Mortals. So this is one of my favorite photos. This is an Nexu 2 rocket standing on the launch rail in Nexu Airport just the evening before launch. And a long exposure just, the light is a little sharp in here, but there is an amazing sky full of stars right above that rocket. And we continually look upwards whenever we're doing stuff in Copenhagen suborbitals. So, who's in Copenhagen suborbitals? Well, in short, we have some awesome, hardcore, skilled, and motivated people. Awesome because they are continually living the dream of reaching for space. They're hardcore because you can rely on them at any point in time. They will get up in the middle of the night and start up a ship or uh, do a cold flow test. Um, they are skilled. We have a lot of members and, and each of them have unique skills. Uh, we have sailors, we have even a kindergarten leader. We have many different skills that are needed as an entire organization to take care of everything that is needed for building, operating and launching and recovering rockets. Um, highly motivated. I mean, these people could be doing anything else, but they continually invest their time and their skills in trying to reach out for space. So there is a reason for being a part of Copenhagen Subdomensals, getting in, and then probably staying there for quite a while. 
the timeline. I will actually come back to this one repeatedly, but it just goes to show a little bit of what is needed for a journey of trying to reach out for space. Copenhagen Suborbital started back in 2008 and then built up the first and the biggest rocket so far in amateur space history. Over the years, we have built a number of rockets. Most of them have flown, a few have not. And right now we're at this line here, which actually means we've come quite a long way. Right now, we are looking to this one, the last and biggest rocket of them all. It's going to be the biggest and the baddest uh, amateur rocket ever built. Um, the entire mission statement and the um, goal of this uh, volunteer-based society is to reach out for space and to do it in a very special way. First of all, being amateurs, that's completely unheard of for amateurs trying to reach space like that. But we take it one notch further. As far as we know, we are the only amateur space, cram, space program, manned space program in the world. Why would anyone undertake something like this? The end goal is to take a small, very small space capsule and just bring it up above 100 kilometers, which is the edge of space. And then of course, bring that person safely back home. Um, it also underlines a mission statement, which is if you meet people, general people and ask them, hey, do you want a job in the space business? Then in many cases, they just, like you, they, they recoil and say, no, 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 this is, that's way too complicated. I cannot do that. One of the things that Copenhagen Suborbital is trying to prove is that honestly, I mean, space flight, rocketry, launches, that's all just math, physics, chemistry, and metallurgy. It's actually doable. So trying to somehow get rid of this um, weird notion that space is very, very difficult. It can be done difficult, but it can also be done reasonably simple. So, let's see if I hit the right one here. We're going to take a look just quickly and go through some of these. I promise you there'll be a lot of entertainment. that launch. The first one is that the two seconds from they said zero to ignition is the longest two seconds of my life. I mean, time literally stops. It's like, no, no, it's not ignite. It's not ignite. And then the second part is the rolling thunder under that sky. There is a very nice uh, sound uh, uh, part in here, but it honestly does no credit to that rumbling thunder that was under the sky that day. I'll never forget it. Secondly, it went straight and it went according to plan for once. <laughs> so getting up is easy. Getting down in a parachute, really difficult. So finally, we made it we made a full mission cycle, which was the whole prerequisite of starting up the speaker development. At this point, we it's no longer a dream actually. It's within reach. 
it can be done. So we have started the production of this huge rocket here. Right now we are finishing up the propellant tanks in the first sections, as Thomas showed in the video earlier. And if we can keep this up, there is a chance that this rocket will go to space. We will hopefully do the first launch in 21, that is unmanned, of course. It'll have to fly repeatedly and safe several times, maybe three to five, before even considering putting a man on top. But that changes the stakes at that point quite substantially. So I hope this gives a little insight into why space is so interesting, so captivating and motivating. And honestly, anyone that can get to do rockets in space, by all means, go there. You'll never regret it. The second reason for why we're here today is turbo pumps. And turbo pumps, in some cases, can be referred to, or some choose to refer to it, as the holy grail of rocketry. I'll try and give you a little bit of impression as to why they're so important and why so much emphasis has gone into them. So. I made a very crude uh, figure here, which has performance and efficiency, and then it has complexity. Starting back in the early days, a turbo pump was a large, bulky device with a, a pump on either side and a turbine in the center. It was possible to fly reasonably big rockets um, using this technology. And about this time, the power output of one of these was approximately 600 uh, horsepower. So time moved along and so did the, uh, the science or scientific progress on this. This is an old rocket uh, collection, a Russian one, which goes into the Soyuz of Vostok. And at this point, they become more elaborate, much more elaborate. In 1957, the performance is increased to about 2,800 horsepower. So this is enough to more or less bring humans into space a few years later. Now, this other one here is one of my favorites. This is probably one of the biggest, baddest Russian engine assemblies possible. And the turbo pump looks like something like this up here. And by 1988, you have something like a quarter of a million horsepower in this thing. This, I mean, this is an amazing development. I mean, why do you want to go from 600 to a quarter of a million horsepower? I try to give an impression of what this is because <coughs> up here, that's the main, that's just the shaft of this turbo pump. And if you look at the turbine here, a super alloy turbine, it's approximately 42 centimeters in diameter, so a large pizza plate. It rotates at a reasonably small 14,000 RPMs. And then it has something like 119 megawatt output. So for three and a half minutes, I took something for comparison. This is the wind farm Juan Sreo 1, 48 wind turbines, 2 megawatt each. And on a windy day, you need two of these to make up for that one. So why did, why did, why did science go into such an endeavor into making something as crazy as this? I mean, to do this, you need an, an, an inlet pressure on that turbine of roughly 500 bars, pure oxygen, 700 degrees. It's completely crazy. It also means that if a nut comes loose or a ball bearing has a problem, unleashing a quarter of a million horsepower in a bad way will end the mission quite suddenly. <laughs> so, and this is of course because in the endeavor to bring every last percent of performance and efficiency out of rocket engines, bringing ever more cargo into orbit every single time, you need to, you can decide to take this very far. It's also very expensive. So back to earth on turbo pumps and the new space industry. Um, I've taken a little bit of a comparison here. This little pencil down here is the speaker rocket, the biggest rocket we could imagine building compared to an, an Iron 5 and a Falcon 9. So these ones use some of what you saw or sort of equivalent, but the new space business is not something like this over here. That's for the old established uh, um, stakeholders in the business. The new space business is a little more something like this. 
speaker is still small compared to these. Of course, the redstone is very old, but this is where new space will be going. And as I've been mentioned, there is a whole multitude of launches underway. Each of these will be capable of bringing a payload into low Earth orbit, which is what the space business wants for the coming decades. So, turbo pumps in the classical approach. I took a simple one, which is one of the smallest engines with a functional turbo pump. Um, there is still some pipe work here, even though this is 1965 technology, reasonably simple. To a certain extent, it carries a, out, a layout which is akin to the first turbo pump I showed you, a center turbine and a back to back pump impeller. This is enough to make a decent engine and a decent engine performance. It doesn't have to be worse than that. Still, I'll show you what a difference it will make. So, turbo pumps in the modern approach. These ones, this one is to a certain extent similar to this one, but this one is gas powered. So you get rid of all the hot parts, all the plumbing, all the pipework, and the chance of something going wrong in that combustion. So if you can do this electrically, it just becomes a much, much cleaner design. And of course, this is quite interesting to Copenhagen's of orbitals as well, because this little unit here fits nicely on top of the rocket engine uh, that we're gonna need for the speaker mission. Copenhagen's of orbitals choose at this point in time to go still with a pressure fed rocket. Turbo pumps are really nice, but there's also an aspect of safety and reliability. Of course, when the turbo pump here has shown to be reliable to the extent of a pressure fed system, there is no reason for not using this one. And I'll show you a bit of what it will do, because this is the speaker rocket, about 14 meters in length as it looks right now. It will weigh four tons fully fueled, so a lucky astronaut will be sitting on top of nearly two and a half tons of propellants. But a pressure fed and a tump turbo pump version has a couple of very distinct differences. First of all, speaker would be two meters shorter. Secondly, it would weigh a ton less going to 105 kilometers. 500 of those kilograms would be propellant that was no longer needed because the engine would work much more efficiently. Secondly, the tanks would become much, much lighter. They don't need the pressure anymore the pump will provide that. So another 500 kilograms disappear from the tanks. So building a three ton launch vehicle is way, way easier than a four ton launch vehicle. This is why turbo pumps are interesting. So I don't like showing off the competition, but somebody got a good idea with electrical turbo pumps. And now I can't see anything from here. First of all, as I mentioned, improved engine efficiency. You can get a lot more payload for the same amount of fuel. You get lighter and fewer engines because the harder, the, or the more pressure these you work under, the more efficient they are, just like a turbocharged uh, car engine. Significant advantages over pressure fed cycles, in our case, a ton, which is a significant advantage. Um, secondly, um, the electric turbo pumps can be a commercial of the self unit. All the other turbo pumps in the business are purpose built for exactly a particular engine. So a short development cycle makes it easy. The engine itself is much easier to control. The crisp control of an electric motor is way better than the, let's say the wobbly um, gas cycle of a turbo pump, which is gas powered easily throttling, throttling, and the best part of it is high reuse potential. So there is a, really some, uh, some warranty into, into going into these electric turbo pumps. So CS is developing uh, onwards as we can. So right now we are doing, this is our old injector from the BPM-5 engine. We have decided that we need to go into swirl injectors. It's quite different technology, but it's more efficient than just the so-called shower head injector. A lot of elements like this one, which is a coaxial swirl injector, 
That means an inner chamber with a spray out and then an outer chamber which forms a spray at the same place. So if you have two of these sprays colliding, you will get really good mixing of the propellants. And for the BPM 100 engine, we will need approximately 160 of these swell nozzles. However, 160 swell nozzles is better than a few thousand very small holes. So at this point, I just wanted to give you an impression of how much propellant an engine like that is going to need. What we have here is our new water flow test stand, which is intended to test a speaker size injector. In this case, we filled one of the tanks up with uh, 300 liters of water, and then we added nine bars of pressure behind that. And then we opened the propellant lines, which on the speaker engine is probably going to be two lines of four inches, so 100 millimeters each. That is an enormous amount of propellant, approximately, approximately up to 50 kilograms per second. And this just goes to show that um, in order to do development on engines like this, you just need a different kind of equipment. But we got it, we are building it, and that's what we've been using the last year to do. So the speaker construction is underway, and we now have all the uh, equipment needed to, to do the injector development of this as well. So this, all of this water actually went over our building, got caught by the wind, and then suddenly the, um, the training area for uh, uh, driver licenses on the other side of the building got a very sudden rain shower. <laughs> and uh, on the other side of the street was a group of random people which just uh, in standing up and clapping just at this point. We don't know how high it went, <sighs> probably about 50 meters. But anyway, 300 liters of water into the air, all coming down as droplets. So, Copenhagen Suborbitals is crowdfunded. We have about 1,000 supporters out there which give a little money every month, say $10, $20. And what we give them is a story because all of our endeavors, including our launches and the onboard video cameras, as you saw, all of that is streamed to YouTube and the internet and everyone when we're doing launches. All of this and countless hours of entertaining uh, endeavors, some successful, some less successful, is available in this, uh, in our channel here. Secondly, we do a lot of blogs. We're an open project and we tell the story about trying to go through all these trials, eventually hopefully succeeding and going to space. There is a whole lot of blog in there on the development of rockets as well. Now, lastly, when you spend all your money buying uh, orbital machine shares, if you have any pocket money left, <laughs> there is always the possibility of throwing a little of that in our direction if you think it's a worthwhile project. So we're trying to break uh, the barrier here. And if Copenhagen suborbitals would, would actually succeed in building that speaker rocket, putting a man, or actually given a weight budget of 350 kilograms, including passenger, it's probably going to be a passenger about this high, probably long here, and 40 something kilos. That's the only way to do it. If that happens before our Indian colleagues perhaps do it, then the it would be a very exclusive list starting in with Russia, United States, China, again India if they if they don't get delayed. But the potential or the possibility of a Danish amateur space organization being the fourth or the fifth uh, one in the world with a national capability of putting astronauts in space, that would be quite some achievement. And it would show that it's possible to go to space for everyone. So thank you very much for your attention. Well, that is all for now. So as always, thank you for watching and supporting. If you don't want to miss any of our future updates, make sure to subscribe and ring the notification bell so we can see you next time when we get one step closer to space.